Pex Talks, a show that explores the world of horror through interviews with filmmakers, actors, writers, and some truly unique individuals. I am your host, Laurie Brewster, and I am a horror filmmaker myself, with seven feature films under my belt. Together, we are going to learn more about the world of independent film and the incredible influence that horror has had over the lives of some truly fascinating individuals. Hello there, and I am delighted to be joined by my amazing colleague at Hex Studios, Sarah Daly. Now, just so I can embarrass you, Sarah, with an introduction, uh, Sarah is one of the most successful independent film producers from Scotland, and she has achieved remarkable things from screening works at Sundance and South by Southwest to producing a book that was released with Harper Collins, with Joseph Gordon Levitt, and whose works and scripts have been performed by the likes of Gary Oldman, Anne Hathaway, and even the pop star sensation, Sia Furler. Wow, I do but, sound fancy. Yeah. Thanks. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing with Hex, but so in this uh, conversation, uh, we want to explore your experiences as a female film producer and, <laughs> and writer, uh, some of the, your thoughts on the industry. To begin, um, I'd have, I have to ask, you know, tell us about you, the artist. You do so many things, writing, singing, producing, uh, yes, I do. I guess, um, ultimately, though, it all comes from a place of wanting to tell stories. And that's something that I've always just instinctively wanted to do since I was very little. Um, so all of these different manifestations of that from songwriting to producing to script writing poems, whatever it is, it's all from this same place, which is a compulsion, really, to tell stories of various kinds and I don't like to be restricted to one medium, I guess. I mean, you've found success in, in multiple mediums. Um, I mean, geez, even as a singer-songwriter, you had a commercially released album as well. It's, it's kind of crazy. In fact, to be honest, even my break as a, as a filmmaker and producer came about thanks to your talents as a storyteller. Um, I think so many of us as artists can draw our original inspiration from simply wanting to tell stories, you know, drawing pictures, making comics and things like that. But when I think of your storytelling abilities, uh, let's take, for example, um, the story of Morgan M. Morganson, which is a, a kind of steampunk setting and a character with inspirations from silent cinema, but it has a wonderful voiceover with your kind of nonsense ring, kind of like a Jack, uh, Jackawoki? Jacka Jabber, <laughs> Jabberwocky. Yeah. yeah. And this perhaps was the start of your big break, really. Uh, one that, that I was able to share, unfortunately. But this resulted in Hollywood star Joseph Gordon Levitt cold calling you on the phone because he'd read it and thought you were some kind of genius. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, basically he, he, yeah, he came across the story that I'd written. Um, at the time I, I wrote it while I was working this awful office job that I hated, um, but I was in the lucky position that I, there was no one who could see my screen. <laughs> so so in, in down times I would sort of pick away at this story that um, came to me out of the blue, I guess. Uh, so I eventually I put it I put it on the internet and Joseph Gordon-Levitt found it and, and liked it, I guess, and wanted to produce it into a short film. So yeah, that was hugely exciting and unexpected and led to some really amazing things happening. Sure. Um, the, the, the first of which was that film screening in front of Robert Redford in South by Southwest. 
No, sorry, Sundance. <laughs> what would Robert Redford be doing in South the Southwest? Trying Got to lost, the I don't know. Down. <laughs> yep. And I, I have literally seen a video of Robert Redford watching your film with a kind yeah. of tear forming in his eye. Yeah, you um, didn't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, the success of that film uh, was also celebrated in the culture section of USA Today and it was mentioned in Rolling Stone magazine. Yeah, it was it was such a weird one because I mean I I studied script writing at um college and you know that was what I was trying to do, you know, on the side as I was working these office jobs. But it it's funny that the thing that eventually got me some recognition as a writer was not a script but a story um that I'd written. And I think a lot of the cool things that have happened have come about in strange, unexpected ways rather than the ways, rather than very strict, obvious paths. And I think that's something that all creatives should leave some room for. There's no one path to success in this industry. Sometimes if you just express yourself and do what you are good at um, and are open-minded, then these weird, magical, unexpected things will happen. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, f from that short film script that you'd written, you had been writing uh, many scripts and poems and, and songs as well. So as an artist, you were exploring, and still do, multiple disciplines. Um, the short film Morgan M. Morganson would be followed up by another sh uh, film, Morgan M. Morganson's uh, date with destiny no the zeppelin zoo that's it uh, which yeah. was a sequel uh yeah basically the <laughs> the first one sort of went so well uh that uh again joe scorn never got in touch um to speak about doing a sequel uh which they hoped would be ready in time to screen at south by southwest so i uh, yeah i said about writing a second installment and of course you came on board to create the amazing visuals to bring it all to life. And yeah, this, the second one also had Channing Tatum, dreamy. Yeah, originally you had written in the script that Channing Tatum would perform his character nude, but unfortunately, um, yeah, conservative moral, moral requirements made him have to wear clothes. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a cut somewhere, but... Um, as yet unreleased. <laughs> so this film played at South by Southwest and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt flew you out to Austin, Texas and um, I was there luckily enough and we had <laughs> um, the opportunity as well to meet a fan of that film who was none other than Sean Ono Lennon. And that was remarkable. What was it like meeting him and, and having dinner with him? Uh, very, very, very surreal. Uh, since, you know, we hadn't had any level of real success before then, I guess, or, or met any celebrities. So that to not only meet him, but to be invited out to dinner with him was just nuts. And yeah, really surreal and very, very memorable experience. For sure. It's interesting the, that these initial successes and, and, and successes that you still continue to have with your work, with celebrities and, and stars, often in the realm of art house or kind of or theatrical performance. Um, your works have been performed on stage in the LA Orpheum Theatre by like Gary Oldman and and you know, a, a whole list of celebrities, Anna Kendrick's, you know, too, lo too long to name. It's interesting that you are often a go-to for these folks that want this uh, kind of unique theatre, art house style writing. But at the same time, you're also a producer and a writer of genre films as well. The first proper genre film being Lord of Tears. Yeah, so uh, I guess that was, what, 2010? 
Yeah. I'm, something like that. 2011, maybe. We started writing that, shot it in 2012, something like that. It's hard to keep track of these things. I think it was 2010 yeah, or 2011, a long time ago. The Great yeah. Snow was 2010, and I think... So that was, yeah, so it must have been 2011 then. Um, yeah, so that was our, our first, like, proper feature film project, let's say. Um, and it's hard to it's it's sometimes hard to remember where it where these things come from you know what i mean there's never a moment where we're like we just sit down and we're like okay we're gonna make this film we just knew that we wanted to make another feature we'd made white out which is which was kind of an experimental foray um seizing an opportunity when we saw how much snow there was and that you could create something quite special quite easily yes i mean in a way it's, it's a good example that I, we shouldn't s skip over, I suppose, but it was a feature film that me and you and a, and a small team produced that, for all its limitations, uh, allowed us to finance uh, Lord of Tears and and the, the genesis, you could say, of, of Hex as well. Um, but yes, when, when we were developing Lord of Tears, it was, yeah, our first ever horror film, our first ever supernatural thriller. And I think the supernatural and and the unusual have always been a kind of guiding influence and inspiration in your works. Yeah, yeah, from, from the darker side of things to the lighter side of things, everything that I've written really has some fantastical element to it. Like, I've never been drawn to gritty realism, I guess. <laughs> Um, although I always want to bring an element of emotional realism and naturalism to the films that we make, but in terms of storytelling, yeah, I don't, I don't like to be bound by naturalism because that's so limiting. I, I, I don't see why you would do that when you've got a whole world of possibility to explore. So yeah, that's why horror and fantasy and sci-fi have always been I guess my my natural go tos. Uh, Lord Lord of Tears was produced with uh, the actress from the Morgan A. Morganson films, uh, your friend Alexandra Nicole Hume, and mm -hmm. uh, it seems that you guys made a great collaborative pair on on that film, sharing ideas and and developing such a unique character for her as well. You and Alexandra Nicole Hume did have a special bond really you've collaborated on lord of tears and the black gloves and the devil's machine as well yeah i have like massive respect and love for alexander nicole hume and that's one of the other unexpected awesome things to come out of the morgan and morganson morganson um series was she was the amazing performer um who played destiny in those films and ever since then yeah, we've just kept up a correspondence and just loved collaborating and inspiring each other throughout film projects and, and everything in between, really. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be collaborating again, hopefully, in some way this year. Also, she's an incredibly talented actress and also a dancer, choreographer and just an artist in every sense, really. So in, in terms of Lord of Tears and the successes you had prior to that, what do you feel were the greatest lessons that you learned as a, I guess, as a producer and writer as well? I think that even, even when your, your core goal is to be creative and to make art, you also have to be pragmatic um, or else nothing will ever happen. You know, you have to have a drive to to make things happen with whatever resources you have available um you know a lot of people will have their one perfect script that they want to work on for 10 years or 15 years until it's perfect and then they'll release it out into the world and it i don't think that's the right attitude i think you just have to have the goal of getting things finished getting things made and learning as you as you go on, you know, learning by doing, improving with each project that you make and not trying to make things perfect. I think a lot of us are perfectionists, but it holds you back. And um, it's, 
a counterproductive goal, <laughs> I think. I, I say uh, one of the things that I've always been struck by has been the way you manage to combine that strength of imagination with a very severe and realistic sense of pragmatism. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I enjoy boundaries. Um, I find that they help me to be more creative rather than less. Like I like having restrictions. For example, with Lord of Tears, you know, I knew the location that we had and I had a good idea of what uh, actors we were going to be working with. So using those ingredients, I was able to try to get the most out of what was available. Um, working within those parameters and I, I enjoy the challenge of that. I think it, it pushes me to work faster and also more creatively. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's, it can seem like pragmatism, but actually it's helpful for my creativity as well to have these restrictions. I'm sure Oscar Wilde had a, a great quote about that, something about the absence of limitation that the, 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 enemy, en the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. Ah, yes, exactly. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I can really like flounder, that's the word, when I don't have a deadline or a specific project that I need to make. I think mm -hmm. a lot of artists struggle with that. I think everyone needs deadlines. Um, so well, yeah, one that's of, important. One of, my, um, one of my challenges as a producer is I often quite like excess as well. So for example, if there's like 15 guys in goblin outfits burning in flames I might want 30 guys in goblin outfits burning in flames yeah and then <laughs> and then we have a conversation and it's 20. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Lord of Tears but that was quickly followed by the unkindness of ravens and um that was a very different project. Lord of Tears is like a gothic, romantic, uh, Michael Budget film, really, whereas The Unkindness of Ravens is a uh, visceral, dramatic, but also gritty portrayal of a military veteran suffering from PTSD. And that story was merged with strong, iconic themes from Norse mythology concerning the demonic form of the Valkyrie, which had uh, preceded the um, large-breasted woman form, <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead being a kind of horrible raven-like creature. Um, what, I mean, what was your approach for that? Something so different to anything you had written before? I mean, they can they can seem superficially different, but ultimately, they're both inspired by mythology and they're also both the tale of individual characters at the limits of what they can take. Um, so crumbling as what they believe to be real falls apart around them. Uh, so ultimately it's, it's looking to mythology for inspiration in terms of almost the, the background or the plot um, but then also focusing very hard on the individual, their emotions, their psychology to drive the sort of heart of the film. So in that sense, Lord of Tears and Ravens have a lot in common really and my approach was probably pretty similar. Obviously with Ravens though, being that it deals with PTSD, um, with a military veteran, of course I did a lot of research in into these things, into um, you know historical wars, and into the experience of modern day veterans to to try and inform the film in a way that would make it feel authentic, to, despite the fact that it has obviously these supernatural elements. The the human element had to feel genuine and affecting, and honest and respectful. It did feel that the film managed to combine those themes very effectively. Um, I remember when the movie premiered at Fright Fest in London that military veterans and a counsellor as well at a veterans hospital um, both commended the film uh, to, to us personally and that uh, some of them are our Facebook friends now as well. 
Yeah, um, no, that was amazing. Like that's the best endorsement you could ever possibly get. So that, yeah, that felt really good to feel like we'd done the subject matter uh, service, you know. The project after that um, was, well, two films really that were filmed almost around the same time, but spread across a couple of, <laughs> two or three years. And that is the film War, The Black Gloves. And what's called The Devil's Machine, although it was originally titled Automata as well. Two strikingly different films, um, at least to me in an aesthetic visual way, but I guess thematically there is more connecting them. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, and the Black Gloves and The Devil's Machine? Um, yeah, like you say, in terms of visuals and their style, they're very, very different. Like The Devil's Machine is obviously very bright and colourful. It's it's all about ex excess. It's quite campy in a, in a way. Whereas The Black Gloves is very austere. It's black and white, of course. It's very restrained, reserved. Um, but again, in terms of the story, um, they both deal with a lot of the same themes, the, the effects, the often devastating effects of the past on the present, issues of mental health, um, issues of what, what is real and what isn't, what can we believe in. Yeah, despite their visual differences, again, story-wise, they do have some common strands, both of them, and they're both also quite theatrical films, um, which our films tend to be. <laughs> we love a bit of melodrama. I, yes, I mean, of, yeah, of course, this this is where the director has to take the responsibility or blame. Um, well, being some, something, I mean, the dialogue is hardly understated and naturalistic either, is it? Well, I think um, it's. I think it's, it's safe to say that we're probably both romantic and or romanticists which is as an art movement, which isn't as in vogue at the moment. Um, it certainly has been and will be again, but we tend to like putting emotions at the fore. And that isn't always in terms of performance, but it can be in terms of the poetry of dialogue. Like for example, the Uncanny of Ravens featuring this enigmatic and powerful dialogue of poetry. That, that our character writes, you know, why would you do that? You know, that's a romantic decision. Um, or it might inform the visual aesthetic. For example, like with The Devil's Machine, when we chose to uh, use a, a visual aesthetic that was associated normally with, with campy Gothic melodrama um, of the types that Mario Baba or even Dario Argento would use, but within it, tell a story of abuse and, and how the effects of abuse can ripple over time. But we didn't make it easy on our audience either by giving a kind of um, social realistic or dramatic naturalistic performance that lets you softly know this is a story about abuse because everyone's got hung drawn faces mm -hmm. and everything's got a cold colour palette and there's kind of grey. You know, we kept with this kind of effusive style of dialogue and, and colour. In fact, I think it's interesting that films, The Black Gloves and The Devil's Machine, are probably also our most divisive among audiences. Um, mm -hmm. What do you yeah, think well, about that? I mean, neither film sets out to make the audience feel comfortable. That's not the point. You know, um, the kind of horror that we love is the kind of horror that puts that feeling of rising dread in your stomach. And I think in both films, we did achieve that. It's not necessarily a pleasant feeling. And I think if, if people go into those films expecting a fun roller coaster ride, you know, that's not exactly what they're going to get. There's elements of that, of course. There's, you know, there's entertainment in there but the themes and the feeling are quite uncomfortable and should make you question things, which, you know, not everybody wants to do when they're watching a film, <laughs> but that's what we want to do with our films. No, I, I agree. I, I think oftentimes a uh, film or a story that might, that might 
give the impression of a moral or ethical intellectual curiosity doesn't really provide the question, but only looks to provide a sense of answer and validation to someone's pre-existing belief. So for example, yeah. a, story, a, a film that is supposed to be about abuse might not try to portray the charisma or moral ambiguity of, of the abuser and how they can, for example, at times seem like a good guy, inviting the yeah. audience to like that person, which is what a victim does, and that's how they can become abused, but would simply yeah. portray a kind of vicariously expressed kind of emotive depression porn that lets yeah. them... <laughs> well, everybody likes to think that they would be the good guy, that they'd immediately recognize the baddie and put a stop to what they're doing. But that's not what happens in real life, you know? Ab ab abusers are insidious, they're charming. That's the reason that they get away with things for, you know, years or decades or forever. Um, the film The Devil's Machine um, provoked some outrage in some quarters because they felt the villain was not appropriately, um, shall we say, uncharismatic. The way he could swing between horror and charisma was something that they, I guess, really affected their cognitive dissonance to the point where they felt the film was endorsing the monstrous behavior of the character? I mean, it's ob obviously it isn't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I really don't feel like I should need to explain why the villain is obviously a villain. And... <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like Ralph Fiennes is quite charismatic at times in Schindler's List, but <laughs> yeah, but that yeah, doesn't mean not the film is endorsing Nazism, anti-Semitic violence and Holocaust. No. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think if people don't want to get that, they're not going to get that. If they want to come away feeling smug and righteous, then that's what they're going to do. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to write films that challenge people and that portray nuanced um, villains. Ironically, at times, there have been some audiences critical though of, of those aspects who have not acknowledged you as an artist that created them, but instead assumed they were men. Yeah, had... it's, yeah, it's funny that it's their inherent misogyny that accuses the films of being <laughs> misogynistic. You know, there, there were people who accused the devil's machine of being told with a male gaze, even though obviously I'm the writer and producer and was there for the shoot and your portrayal of my story is very faithful. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's just an assumption that because the director is male, that it's 100% entirely his vision, even if the writer is a woman. Yeah, that's right. And, and interestingly that, it does run parallel to my own concern about the way audiences perceive directors. But then that's, you know, as you know, I've never really been a fan of auteur theory or the, or the idea that the director is the principal artist. You know, I think a director should have good ideas, but the best idea they can have is oftentimes an open-mindedness for collaboration with other great artists. And that might not be a fashionable point of view because we do all like to imagine the idea of these geniuses. For example, A24 likes to put its stable of directors as these kind of incredible focused um, artists when we know the reality and any filmmaker knows the reality that the guy bringing you an espresso at 3 a.m. is going to make as much a creative contribution yeah. <laughs> as the cinematographer yeah. keeping you alive, you know? Um, Interestingly, uh, the Black Gloves also deals with the unusual serious themes um, which consist of the nature of how abuse of some type, and I don't want to use the word too casually because it is used in social media as too casually now, um, but there could be an aspect of it with the character of our psychologist who is portrayed at the start of the film as someone on a mission to rescue a young woman who then becomes 
corrupted by the power he can wield over that person, but then you also spin it around again. You keep this kind of moral ambiguity spinning, in fact, frantically, um, to the point where we cannot draw a two-dimensional perspective on the ethical governance of any one character. It's like you want yeah. to show a maelstrom of, of ethics. Yeah, well, I mean, in reality, that's what most people are like. Nobody is 100% good or 100% evil. We all, all have impulses within us. And, you know, everyone mostly is just trying to do their best to, with varying degrees of success. So, you know, for example, the main character in, in The Black Gloves, um, the psychologist, he believes that he's saving these people like he consciously that's what he thinks he's doing he's a white knight he's out to save these women from whatever it is that is haunting them but actually it's his own ego and obsession that's driving him to find out the cause of their madness it's more about him than it is about them and his refusal to admit that is what drives him to the point of madness really Absolutely. It's definitely uh, a great example of the of how easily, uh, for example, ideas such as chivalry can become perverted when they become about self-gratification and, and, yeah. and, and power. Yeah, it's basically a story of the danger of male hubris. <laughs> <laughs> I he gets his comeuppance. <laughs> <every day. laughs> Lucky I'm here to keep it in check. <laughs> So we have these two um, complex and divisive films uh, which have as, as many fans as, as they do critics or folks that misunderstand them for what they are. Um, but at the same time, they've been commercially successful and they have placed you in a position where you have written other films, um, quite different ones. One of them, in fact, I say quite different, perhaps they're both fantasies, but in very different ways. Uh, one of them was uh, a freelance gig where you wrote Kids vs. Monsters, which was a very high budget film. It was uh, millions of dollars produced in LA with Malcolm McDowell and Armand Asante and Lance Henriksen and, and Francesca Eastwood as well, Clint Eastwood's daughter. And that was in LA, had the special effects team behind Aliens, Predator and the, the new It film. And it's, it's just a, it's basically like a, a kid's movie, like a Nickelodeon movie. But then on the other hand, you've also written and conceived of this epic fantasy world for Dragon Knight, as it's called, which is a film um, just in post-production now, which we've uh, recently just shot. And that's a sword and sorcery movie. So tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I love fantasy. I've always loved fantasy ever since I was little. I, you know, draw, draw maps of different worlds and write sort of Alice in Wonderland-esque type stories and elves and fairies and all sorts. So, um, yeah, having the opportunity to write Dragon Knight was loads of fun for me because it's, it's the epitome of world building, which is what draws me to storytelling in the first place. So being able to cre create a whole other world populated with different characters that are sort of related to our own or allegories for our own, but entirely of my own invention or our own invention is very exciting. Um, so yeah, that was, that was loads of fun. And I, I look forward to doing more of that as well. So you like the idea of expanding that universe with additional stories and just filling in that whole world. You would be yeah. like J.R. Tolkien. Yeah, that'd be fun. Not for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the moment, though, you have not just films in the bag, but you are also the leader, president, chairwoman, ninja lady of a publishing company. Yep. So um, last year we launched Tex Arcana Publishing. Um, put out our first book, which is the book of Beastly Creatures, um, featuring horror short stories that are really 
fun and pulpy and vibrant and um, exciting with really gorgeous illustrations, um, sort of a retro vibe. And that's the sort of feel that, we're, that we want for all of the books that we put out. So we've got another project that we'll be announcing very soon that I'm very excited about um, for the publishing label. And yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll do another couple of books before the end of this year as well. Uh, that's fantastic. As if films weren't enough for you, you had to have a publishing company as well. And uh, I, <laughs> so you're co-owner of Hex Studios and you're running Hex Arcana Publishing as well. You're an artist, but you're also a business woman as well. Um, do you, how do you feel all that responsibility affects your ambitions for the future? Are you looking to try and um, keep doing all these things and grow? Or are you hoping to spin off some of those things and focus on other areas? Uh, what kind of things would you like to accomplish in 2021? I think it's always about trying to find a balance because I do enjoy both aspects. Like I enjoy the machinations of business and being entrepreneurial and ambitious um and i also of course love creativity but i don't enjoy so much the administrative side of everything um so yeah that's definitely something that i'll hope to spin off a bit more next year just you know things like accounting and scheduling and um you know there's a part of me that likes these things because i am a very organized obsessive person <laughs> but I would like to preserve more of my energy for doing more creative projects this year and kind of return to music um, for sure because I haven't really had a chance to do that for a couple of years and also to just, just do more writing of various kinds write more screenplays more poetry um, just work on some some new projects develop some things i don't have any doubt that that you shall and it is a particularly exciting as well to hear about your return to music as well uh with the with the idea of either producing a new album or just producing new tracks and and like a social media presence for that art yeah i think i'll, I'll start with just producing a few tracks and then see where that takes me. But I'm, I'm starting to get the urge again. It kind of comes and goes. You've previously worked with Kate Bush's sound engineer, ex-husband, and you're related to Kate Bush as well, I think. Is that mm -hmm. right? All of these things are true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's my first cousin once removed. Oh. Yeah, I didn't know what that was until I realized I was related to Kate Bush. And then, of course, you have to figure out the very specific relationship. Shame I couldn't be related to Kate Bush. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's probably too late for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, talking to me today about the projects you've worked on and what you've got coming up. And... I'm sure all of you at home watching this wonderful episode of Hex Talks will be delighted at the prospect of Sarah returning to chat about current events in film and about the cultural shifts taking place among audiences and tastes and all these things because clearly she is smarter than I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you. I shall say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Be sure to hit subscribe and the bell notification icon so you don't miss any of our future videos. Also, if you would like to support our channel and help us make more content, then check out the Patreon link in the video description below. Thank you and goodbye.